Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, as you may know, this is devconf.us, and we're really excited to have you. And uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the conference and a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm Langdon White, and uh, I am in. Uh, I have a weird job now, but uh, basically, I try to do some advocacy for Red Hat around some of our products. Uh, you've probably seen me before because this is my third time running the show. Um, and uh, so, again, kind of thanks all for coming. Uh, it's uh, it's really tough to uh, give a talk like this because uh, you get very little feedback. So uh, you know, kind of fair warning. Um, but. Uh, let me see if I can find my notes because that would be uh, make this a little bit easier. So, DevConf US. Uh, DevConf US is based on DevConf CZ, which I think will be in its 12th year in January. Uh, this is our third year running, but our first time doing a virtual conference. So, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to pull it off and it will be uh, super cool. Um, so, what I want to start with is uh, basically some people who I've been able to pull in um, and uh, Sally O'Malley and Arvashi Mahan, I could never say your last name, um, and uh, each, each person is going to introduce themselves in a minute, but I wanted to give a little bit of background about DevConf in case uh, you are unfamiliar with it. So uh, we celebrate open source at this conference, and what that means is not just open source software, not just free as in beer, but also the communities around it, and how we want to grow those communities uh, and by providing opportunities to speak and providing opportunities to go to a conference, and you know, kind of all those various things. Um, and so, this conference is very focused on you know, basically on new people. So this is an opportunity for people who've never given a talk before to come and give a talk. This is an opportunity for someone who's never been to a conference to come and finally understand what the hallway track is. Uh, we are very focused on developers, um, but uh, we also have a bunch of tracks that are around kind of the other aspects of open source software, like uh, the process of creating it, right? Or the user experience differences when you're working in open source versus when you're uh, working in a proprietary software software company. Uh, so uh, that's kind of a little bit of an introduction to DevConf. Um, and uh, hopefully some of you are new and some of you have been here before. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to one of my first co-chairs, uh, Sally O'Malley. Hello. Good morning. Um, yep, I am Sally. I'm a software engineer working on OpenShift um, by day organizing this virtual event by night. Sometimes those lines get blurry. <laughs> um, I've been to many tech conferences, but DevConf, it's special. Uh, it's about the speakers. It's about developers. It's about people, not products. Um, it's about open source and our community and our ideas. It's about what's next, what we're trying out, what we're working on. I was thrilled and honored to take on this role as co-chair this year. Um, thank you all for being here and thanks for being you and for celebrating this community. And Urvashi, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello everyone, my name is Urvashi Monani. Um, I am a senior software engineer at Red Hat, also working on OpenShift and also working on DevConf by night. <laughs> um, DevConf yes, is actually very special to me um, as it was it's both the first technical conference that I attended and also the first venue at, at which I gave a talk. Um, it, it gave me a platform to talk about and share all the cool stuff that I get to work on. And it set me up with some critical experience for continuing to present in the future. As I entered the room two years ago, I most definitely did not see myself being one of the coaches for DEF Conf US, but accidents can happen. The journey so far has been amazing. And I know DevConf will continue to have this impact on many others, such as my conference buddy here, Mr. Eeyore. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank our track captains for volunteering their time to curate all the content you'll be seeing throughout the conference. I would also like to thank the entire DevConf crew, everyone from event planning to session moderators to stressed out partners. This conference wouldn't be possible without you. So thank you all so, so much for making this possible. And back to you, Langdon. 
All right, clicking all the buttons. Uh, so this is the part at the uh, welcome that we try to give you a little bit about the how to conference. Um, and so these are kind of some of the key highlights uh, and we're gonna kind of go through a few other points and, and kind of tips. Um, first off, one thing I wanna mention, and if you haven't uh, kind of figured it out by now, uh, the code of conduct for this conference is uh, important to us, okay? It's not just a piece of paper as it were, or digital paper as it were. Um, so the kind of core message we want to send is you know the bill and ted's excellent adventure be excellent to each other uh the idea here is that we have lots of new speakers we have lots of new conference goers so if you want to provide criticism that's usually appreciated however you want to be careful about being constructive about it if you want to uh you know kind of communicate with somebody else at the conference uh you know that's great and that's really important to the conference but again be respectful be constructive and those things are really important to this conference we want to make sure that this is a comfortable experience for everyone who's here uh so that they're ready and you know willing to kind of go to the next big conference uh and so that way we can uh you know kind of give you a baseline as a speaker or as an attendee about what's so great about conferences and how to manage those um and so we need all of you to participate in that if you do have a, a problem with the kind of code of conduct, like you, you see something that you're uncomfortable with, please let us know. Uh, you know, it's a lot easier to find us in uh, kind of the global chat than it is uh, running around on the floor of a, of a you know, in-person conference. Uh, so definitely reach out to us if you have any problems whatsoever uh, and let us know. If you have any trouble contacting uh, the co-chairs, you know, myself, Sally or Avashi, um, you know, definitely check out the DevConf booth. Uh, and so what we did this year to kind of have a help desk is we actually made a booth about the conference uh, in the expo hall. So if you notice in the navigation that is probably on your left of your browser or could be on the bottom, depending on the size of the screen you have set up, uh, in, it says expo. And in that area, you'll find, if you scroll down a bit, you'll find the uh, DevConf booth. Uh, there is great information there. Um, for example, some of the stuff that we're gonna show right here. Um, and uh, there's also always someone there to help you out. So if you have a technical problem, you're, uh, you know, you're a speaker and you're worried about how to uh, you know, kind of run your show, we can help you with whatever you need. Um, and uh, you know, basically just making sure that you can have a successful conference. Um, the other thing I want to point out is, you know, the the overlays I did uh, using purely open source software. Uh, so it's an open source kernel driver uh, on Fedora and then uh, OBS on top of that. And hopefully it's not going to fall over in the middle of this presentation. Um, but with all of that, I wanted to hand it off to Sally, who's going to talk a little bit more about how the conference works. Um, to add to that, uh, he has a script that he might share with you in the chat if you ask if you would like to also have those overlays. but. Since it did crash, I opted out for this conference. <laughs> uh, so our conference is divided by tracks or rooms. Um, we, we, we wanted to keep it simple. So you find the talk you wanna go to in the schedule and each track, um, and, and then each session in the schedule has a video stream button. That video stream button will bring you back to the room in Hopin. Um, each track or room, it's continuous sessions, speakers, attendees, they'll pop in and out all day. Um, it's similar to in-person events. Um, between talks, you'll hear the moderator and speaker talking about mics or slides. Um, and we encourage you to use the chat between sessions and we encourage you to ask questions in the chat during the sessions for the speaker. Um, so yeah, again, the, <clears throat> there's a video stream link in the schedule for each session that should bring you to the right room and hop in. Um, the schedule is the source of truth to find the individual sessions. So one other point, our, our speakers aren't professional video editors. Um, this, some of them, this is their first time uh, giving a talk at all, much less recording it. Um, so please send them love, encouragement, make it positive um, when, you, when you attend the sessions. However, I have previewed the talks and I am blown away at how good they are. I wish I could sit in every single session and just watch them all. And that brings me to my final point. Um, after each session, if there is a pre-recorded link, it will be uploaded to that video stream button and schedule. 
So after the session's over, that video stream will point to the pre-recorded session. Um, if the session was live, which some of them are, you'll get the hop-in recording as soon as it's made available to us. Um, I think that those are my points. So Urvashi, uh, you have some more things? Yep. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will be having conversations after and or during the sessions. Uh, so if you want to continue those conversations elsewhere, we have breakout rooms under the Expo tab for each track. You can go there and share your audio video to have lively and respectful discussions. We all need to keep our tummies happy, so we have arranged for some delicious food and coffee throughout the conference. To get access, you just need to walk to your kitchen and grab some. Ha! On that hopefully hilarious note, um, I'd like to announce that the DEF CONF US party will be taking place today at 8 p.m. Eastern time. We have a comedy show by Deanne Smith, who has comedy specials on Netflix and broadcast television. So please come and join if you want to have a good laugh and relieve the stress of the day. Um, following the comedy show, we have a show and tell. We're looking to see absolutely anything. Cool collections, dogs, hidden talents, dogs, not so hidden talents, dogs, even if it's your wonderful faces. We miss you, even if we've never met you before. So please head on to the DEF CON viewers booth after the keynote or the reception page to sign up for the show and tell. The DEF CON viewers booth also has the information that you need, FAQs, music playlists, show and tell, all that fun stuff. So please visit the booth to access those or just to drop by to say hi to us. And finally, the call for papers for DEF CON CZ is now open and you can find a link to it at our DEF CON viewers booth. Please send in all your awesome proposals so that we can meet again virtually in January. I know Mr. Eeyore here is definitely looking forward to it. And now Sally will introduce our next segment. Thanks. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> and now the time has come to officially kick off DevConf US 2020 virtual edition. I'm about to hand the mic over, but not without a proper introduction. Vincent Batts, or VBATS, he's the, is by title the Chief Technology Officer at Kimfolk. Now on its mission page, Kimfolk states, when you do open source right, you don't do it alone. You do it in collaboration with the extended open source community. It is so fitting that VBATS is its CTO. He's the maintainer and technical oversight board member of the Open Containers Initiative. He earns major cool points as a member of Slackware Linux's core team. He was a Docker maintainer, maintainer for the Fedora and RHEL Go compiler. The list goes on. He has spent most of his life in Linux and open source. Many of you know him, and there's a reason for that. As full as his plate always is, as much as he contributes, he is so approachable. If you meet up with him, you might have a talk about his parenting philosophies or his home network or his vision for a better world through open source. He's genuinely nice and he's scary smart. We're so glad he's here. If you have questions for Vincent, um, you can add them in the stage chat and he'll answer them at the end. So please welcome Vincent Batts. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I should have turned on my video sooner so you could see me like going, oh no. But, <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. Um, let me share my screen real quick here and then we will get off to the races. Um, but thank you everybody. And I, I am so glad to be here and I'm wish wishing that it could be in person. I've, I've been to um, a number of the DevConf CZs and uh, all of the DevConf US's uh, uh, and even the Dev, one of the DevConf India's, uh, they're wonderful. So a pro, when, when thinking about this talk and like, you know, some of the topics that were kind of recommended uh, and ways to be creative about chatting, the best, I, the best piece that I could think of, you know, especially given some of the things that have happened, you know, for everybody and for me, particularly in the last year or so, is to look back at the golden thread. And it's not like some definition meeting on what a golden thread is. Um, but particularly, we, we kind of re refer to this in, in my household and, you know, with loved ones of like looking at that 
that thing that thing that connects either all of us or your history or whatever it is um, that's so fine, but you usually can only see that glimmering piece of your own uh, history in hindsight. So what is that golden thread? Um, Sally, holy moly, knocked it out with an introduction. I've never had an introduction like that. But um, honestly, I'm, I'm still hands-on keyboard, uh, uh, individual contributor, nerd, and otherwise, but have had um, a number of different dabblings over the years. And I'll, I'll get into this more in a second. But um, it, it, if you uh, have questions or have had experience in any one of these things, feel free to reach out to me because I'm, I'm excited to jump into pretty much any one of those pieces. So um, real quickly, one of the things that this talk, you know, uh, is probably not going to be is any kind of figurative, literal, chemical, spiritual blowing your brains out your butts. It's just not going to be that kind of a talk. If at any point, you know, something is of use to you, great. Um, I, I, I pay a lot of respect in, you know, when teachers convey a message and there's a lot of responsibility in that. Um, and there's, there's nothing precise that I'm saying that you should do or, you know, that will work for you. Um, at best, I'm going to uh, try and honestly cover a little bit of what I found worked for me uh, and probably some of the embarrassing things along the way that have gotten me here. Um, the, the first thing is really that uh, I'll talk a little bit about goals. And uh, this was like when, when the topic came up of like, well, you changed jobs this year and that's exciting. And uh, you, you did it during a pandemic and that probably was not the smartest thing. Even, even <laughs> Chris Wright even said, bless your heart. Um, speaking very much to my Alabama uh, uh, raising. Um, but I, even to go from a, a big company to a very you know small intimate uh, company at Kinfolk. So what, what brought you here? And this got me thinking a little bit further to um, what did get me here? And, and some of that is like, there was a time 10 or 15 years ago that I wrote a five, 10, 15 year goal for myself. And this, this is a little fluffy, but it's, it's one of these things that, A, I'm not a list making person. Um, I've gotten much better at it now, but uh, I've never been good at list making. Um, so it was monumental to sit down and write a list. Um, that was great. But what were the kind of things on it? And I don't have the original list anymore. It, it, it was so private to me that it kind of just it, it iterated for, for a long time. And at that time, 15, this was closer to 20 years ago, for me personally was to have more options than beans and rice. Um, and along that same line is to not miss on... Uh, rent or critical bills or otherwise. Um, that's very, very, very real to me. Um, it, you know, at the point at which you have to like sell off uh, musical instruments so that you can pay your rent is not always an uplifting experience, but it will fortify uh, motivation. I, I was working on open source in my off time and learning, you know, learning and uh, hacking on it, but uh, the idea that you could ever make a meaningful contribution to a project was beyond me. Like I had no idea. Um, I was mostly like, what thing could I do? You know, and kind of an extension of that, but like one of these penultimate things is like to get a commit into the kernel and like, whatever. Um, I had, I had wished and you know hoped to go out of the country at all much less to actually have to do that for work uh and then i had a goal that one day probably you know when i'm 40s and 50 years old um to be the cto you know start a company and act as the cto of it um or whatever lead person whatever i, I had no idea what that would, would entail but um these were like kind of goals for myself. Um, and so don't get me wrong. I, I actually legitimately love beans and rice, but it is a, a, a very cheap meal. And um, thankfully, I did not ruin it for myself eating as much beans and rice as I did. In fact, I still like a lot of beans and rice. But so let's let's fast. Let's let's roll back just a little bit. 
Um, I worked with my dad and my dad owned his own job, uh, self-employed lightning protection. We cleaned hood and vent, um, hood and vents for kitchens and chimney sweep. Um, whether that makes sense in Alabama or not, uh, it, it meant a lot of brick laying. It meant a lot of dirt and filth. And um, if you ever needed motivation for something that you would be like, I, you know, could I make money with computers? Probably, you know, like, yeah, there's fancy stuff, but I just kind of like hacking on open source software. And uh, I guess I'll pay my bills doing this. Um, and that became motivation. Um, so this is this is a unglamorous picture. There's probably other unglamorous pictures of this time, but um, whether I was singing Chim Chimney, Chim Chimney in a penguin tail tux and a top hat or this, this is what it looks like. Um, and on the side, I would be involved in the local Linux user group. I was, uh, in fact, at some point we helped coordinate like an Alabama lug fest. And that was that side. Um, the crazy part was that even even getting involved in like the Linux user groups and talking to other ones across the state or even the Southeast, um, uh, I was blown away by how many people were similarly not, you know, like software professionals by profession. Um, there was people from being plumbers to TV technician repair people, or um, even working like in the anatomy department of the university or whatever, like none of them, like very few of them were actually like IT software people. Uh, and even those that were, were mind blowingly, you know, from you know, all, all the different kinds. Um, it was amazing. And every time I showed up, I was always, asking lots of questions and I was uh, um, impressed by who the experts in the room were and it was great. And it, it, it was always like, I was so eager to learn and effectively come home into my you know basement or whatever and find something to tinker on uh, and you know basically create challenges for myself to learn something new, whether it was like, automated installs or just running a, a WordPress website or I don't know what. Um, and so then I'd go back and I'd find other people that knew more than I did in that particular area. And I'd pester them with questions until they probably exhausted with me would send me to, you know, somebody else who know, knew more or whatever. Um, it, it was, it was just a pattern. Um, but this was like after hour stuff. And I don't think I realized how much I was, um, able to self-learn using basically the power and access, the accessibility in open source, whether it's not just the people or what, but just that you could self-teach yourself um, how to program or how to do any of this stuff and actually learn skills that were um, hireable. Um, that part was had not connected in my brain yet. And uh, it's something that only looking back, like I, I fully realized like, oh, I, I, I taught myself how to run a database and therefore I eventually was paid to do these things. Um, and that, yeah, uh, it's, it was, that was pretty um, much a hindsight looking back thing. And in that situation, one of the patterns that I saw is that you're always, always seeking out the expert in a particular area. And I think one of the good things that that did for me uh, is because it was so low key and because I realized that the experts were frequently, you know, all different situations that they were all just regular people to me. Um, and that it, 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 it made very real that sometimes these people that get treated like rock stars or whatever um, celebrity in their own situation are also just people and they are like, they just happen to know or have experience with the thing that you're um, now trying to learn. Um, so seek them out. Um, and one of the secondary side effects is this, this got me very comfortable um, with the fact of not being the smartest person, you know, in a, in a certain situation uh, or even further when you're finding yourself 
trying to discover a new um, technology or whatever it is, uh, or even a team that you're on later, like that sounds like work talk being on a team, but is to not be the smartest person in the room. Um, you can take this to mean some aspect of like humility, but uh, I also mean this in like true literal sense of like, if you want to just learn stuff by osmosis and like be exposed to discussions that you might have no idea about and are interested in learning about, um, then then like put yourself into places where you you no longer are the smartest person in the room so that you actively must listen um, and ask questions. Uh, it's, it is not always the most comfortable thing because that, that uh, as I was talking about in a second, it, it frequently leads to awkward and effectively vulnerable situations. So there was an aspect of becoming comfortable with being vulnerable and uh, it's not something that's easy, but, and I'm not saying that you should do this because there's times to protect vulnerability. Uh, there's a time to not put everything in the world out there, but there's there's places where you're like uh, effectively having to get a little comfortable with the fact that you're not the most, com you know, you're not the most smart person or whatever in the room. And um, not everybody can do this. And, but that's, that's fine because that means, you know, we, you know we've all, it, witness the people that are like either uh, defensive about what they know or defensive about what they don't know. Um, they might choose to be an asshole about it and they'll make a name for themselves in that way and people will um, treat them accordingly. So uh, you, this is again, find what works right for you, but there is some aspect and at least the discussion topic around allowing yourself this vulnerability. Um, because for me, I realized that it was this was a part of my iteration, um, and the the crazy part was that at some point after exposing yourself in these situations, um, and even in some places like I, uh, some of my first contributions to various projects were either simple, like trying to get something to compile, but most often it was documentation, and. Um, there were times when, yeah, obviously I didn't know what I was doing, but uh, I was frustrated with um, trying to use something. And I realized that it was the docs that were sucking, not that the code was particularly bad itself. Um, and so I'd make changes to the docs. And then there was this like massive role reversal at some point. This The, the first one that came to mind when I was thinking about this was uh, making doc, docs changes in the... SSL C API bindings for Ruby. And uh, I was doing something with SSL, TLS and Ruby at the time. And the documentation was so bad. Oh gosh, it was so bad. And uh, I effectively started filling out most of the docs for that library because uh, I, I needed to use them. And I was confident that they were so bad. There was such a lack of documentation that I was going to misuse and probably implement the SSL TLS stuff wrong just because the docs were bad. And um, that's fine. I was doing it for myself. And then one day somebody pinged me to say that they were looking at like one version of Ruby and were getting frustrated. And then they, you know, the next release came out that actually had docs and it answered the problems that they could then like kind of retrofit to prior versions. Um, and they were, they were so, they were relieved enough about it that they were able that they were willing to find me on something like IRC and let me know that I fixed a problem that they were having. And immediately I realized that this uh, resource of open source, the accessible resource of open source um, is now something that I'm like, I'm indebted to uh, because I, it's, it's like, I, I have, a, I have like this responsibility to that I've made a difference for somebody. Um, and I'm kind of like, yeah, I've self taught myself and I've done so, so until the point that somebody else um, recognized it. And um, for me, that was amazing. And, and I had had other times when obviously I'd like broken compiles and stuff like that. It's, it's people are more quick to tell you that you broke something than fix something, but it was, it was, um, 
uh, it was kind of a milestone for me um, that that you could like make a difference for other people. And well, I just said this, but still that it, it became kind of this reciprocal relationship that not that I was making changes or improvements specifically for the greater good. Often it was because either I had contrived a challenge for myself um, or a use case, or I was working for something that I actually wanted to see working and the side effects were that I helped others. Um, and that line got very gray a number of times and whatever it was that um, was the motivation at that time um, still kept the purpose that I, Vincent Batts, was working on something. And if if it was going to be beneficial, then you know it had to be good for everybody. And that re- led me to the very, very, very real like ref- reflection now that what you do, and truly how you do it, um, whether you like choose to make it good for both parties or at least engaging for both parties or whether you like choose to be an asshole about it. That's your own choice. Um, what you do and how you do, it does make a difference. Um, something that I've found myself saying even to my kids is like, you don't exist in a vacuum. You don't exist in isolation. They're like it is, we're all interdependent. Um, and so you you can pursue your path and realize that you're having cascading effects on others. And it might be years before somebody comes back and says that time that you said something to me, you know, or gave me this pointer or this encouragement years ago um, made a difference. It might be so much in passing that you will never hear that. But you must realize you don't exist in a vacuum at all. Um, so uh, it gets a bonkers concept, I know. But. You, you you must must realize that, and uh, it's probably uncomfortable to think about it to some extent. Um, and so for me, I, like like what is what is making this difference? And like I, I I went from tinkering on open source stuff and you know my basement or whatever like area um, to making like life commitments with a partner, um, uh, wishing to eat whether it was beans and rice or otherwise. Uh, at some point. I was able to make a the switch from um, sweeping chimneys and you know, geez Louise, I did door to door sales and waiting tables and stuff like that to getting like a job at the IT department at a bank. Um, that was monumental. It didn't pay good, but it was monumental for me because it was like somebody recognized that you were you had skills that uh, they were willing to pay for. Um, kids came along. And around the same time, uh, <laughs> not only did I get on with the bank IT, but I actually got denied because I had dropped out of university. I thought university was ridiculous. And so I was denied because I didn't, I couldn't check a checkbox that I had a, um, a degree uh, and I still also wanted to eat. So um, with kids and job and you know everything like this, I also went back and finished university. And um, it, it that process kind of hardened my motivation in that way. And I, I, I really, some of these words are so squishy, I can't believe I'm saying them, but it really, for as ADD as I am, and as much as I don't like making lists, there's times when it's like, oh, this is the reason that I'm you know, like doing these things. And um, it sometimes takes being real with yourself of like why it is that you're even doing that. Um, because it, without having some kind of process and this is true for teams this is why teams do retros or whatever is like what worked what didn't work do this for yourself um uh, i i don't like having choices in life but it's better that you make decisions for yourself like given a choice and uh you know like yeah i don't like decisions they're the worst or choices, but it's better that you do that for yourself than somebody else making that choice for you. Uh, and so sometimes you kind of like, I, I realize there's times when choices are made for you, but I'm saying like, uh, would I rather do this to improve myself or ignore it and uh, see what happens in five years? Make the decision for yourself. Um, because, and I'm, I don't mean like someone specifically, but like the world, life will make that decision for you. and. Uh, it's better that you be involved in the process. 
Um, and so some of those big crazy choices for us were the jump from Alabama to Northern Virginia, DC area. Uh, that was a bonkers move, um, arguably too big of a move because uh, uh, I liked the company that I was working for and I liked a lot of people that I got to work with in that area, but it was uh, a choice that I was quickly looking to change. Um, and I was looking to get closer to the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, uh, keep keep and maintain a, a pace and speed of mind that was important for us. Uh, and there was just happened to be this little company in Raleigh. Uh, so that was that was around 2012. Um, worked at Red Hat for eight years and it blew my mind. Like I never imagined, never, 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 never imagined working uh, for Red Hat. I always suspected that I would do something for pay and I would hack on, you know, open source on the side. And it, it was amazing. And I don't, I don't deter anybody from doing that. Um, it, 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 it's, it, it was, yeah, mind blowing. I don't know what else to say. The big thing that it did do for me though, is it kind of crashed two worlds together because in my mind there were, there was like a pretty little ribbon around one thing and a pretty little ribbon around the other thing. And now it was like, um, I needed to find new hobbies because, uh, the stuff that I did after hours was now the stuff that I did during work. And so it was way too easy to bring work home with me. And there is kind of a benefit mixed advantage to that, but, um, not to feel like you're, you know, your, your hobbies are now prof professionally motivated. I, I'm not always a firm believer of, um, getting paid to do what you love. Like there's, there's, there is a personal and artistic and creative side of things. And then there is, um, strict, kind of like business to things also. Uh, so I did get into, I went back and found music again and it was great. Um, this is a picture of my grandfather. And at some point over the years, uh, I came in contact with his accordion uh, and picked that up for a number of years. But um, that was one of the biggest things is that uh, kind of picking up and pulling these these music back into my life, and there was other things. I'm not a a big TV watcher. I, I actually have never been. Um, I don't I don't play. I intentionally don't play a lot of video games either. Um, so if I'm not like outside in the woods, and it's usually family and music, and otherwise, but I'm making a firm delineation of things that are like work. Uh, whether it is open source for the fun and love of it, uh, or if it's actually something for my own self and well-being, um, because the the part that you must kind of keep in mind is that in open source we are all individual contributors. And I hear that that term sometimes used as if like that's your role, um, like I'm an IC. But uh, at the end of the day, if you make you know whatever comments on on an open source issue mailing list or whatever whatever uh that's your name that's attached to it um and that will carry after you leave even if you create a github account that's per company uh that's it's still you um so these things are all interconnected even yourself uh so there's there's a a, a personal aspect to this and not just like um and I'm not saying like, don't do what, what's right for the company. Also, um, my point is that there is a personal burden of responsibility to do the right thing. And uh, you'll feel that whether you're working during the day or the weekends or whatever. Um, and it, it's, it's very, very important even for your own mental health to stay true to that uh, because you, you, you'll, you'll carry that with you. Um, big, Big funny thing. I mean, like any anytime that you have something that now like I'm I'm passionate about certain projects or I'm passionate about certain technologies, um, and then you you are thrusting yourself to be in the room with smarter people. Uh, it, you're you're destined for aw awkward situations. Um, so this, I don't know if that's quite being vulnerable or what, but like like you're destined to find yourself in awkward situations and uh, that. There's so many times when um, 
okay, so I did. I ended up not going back to school for computer science. It, I was going. I was working for a bank, and they were willing to pay for an accounting degree. So I um, went for like business and accounting. Uh, that's great. Whatever. There's so much stuff that I, I missed out on by not going to university for this. And one of the first, you know, big challenges that I got to tackle when I had joined Red Hat was, you know, kind of a compression situation. There was like this time when a X Avanon certificate was getting put put through an HTTP header, and if it got too big, it would get truncated, and we had to like fit more stuff in a smaller box. Uh, and that was one of the times when I got my brain got wound around some axle and I was working on it on like th thinking about it in the nights and like woke up, you know, thinking about this silly problem. Um, <laughs> not, not because it was like a work initiative, but, but just, it was kind of a puzzle. And I came into the office and started like describing the situation to the other people on the team. And some of them like had masters in computer science and <laughs> they were like, Vincent, you just described, like various type, like they like sent me Wikipedia pages to like a Radix tree or a Huffman tree. And I'm like, this is exactly what we're talking, you know, like what we need to do. And that, you know, it was, it, it was totally like, it, this was me. Like, I was like, yay, we, we found the problem. And they're like, this is textbook. Like you should, you should have gone to college for this stuff. Um, but thankfully we, we, they, there were, a lot of smart people in the room. And this is something that later turned into like a patent with a few people involved. And um, it was not just Radix and Huffman trees, but a few other things. Um, but, you know, if, if I had gotten defensive and, you know, yelled and screamed that like, why don't anybody tell me these things? The situation could have gone poorly, but it, it, it kind of embraced that that awkwardness and um, ability to laugh it off and something might come out of it. So uh, other times that that, that I, I think similar things have happened is that because I approach, you know, have approached things in a situation where you can kind of laugh it off or at least like brainstorm with the smarter people is that sometimes your ideas get mixed into their ideas and um, this is one that, that I can't say works for everybody um, because I think that people should always get their attribution, but do realize that it's almost like a form of flattery that if, if you put yourselves in the situations with people that sometimes the, the good outcome that actually solves the problem might be part of your idea, but it might be somebody else's implementation of it. And you can hope and wish, and hopefully you'll have uh, advocates there that will make sure that you get uh, recognized for those things. But um, the, the, at the end of the day, it, at least for me, one of the biggest important things is that the right solution was arrived at, um, uh, even if it was somebody else's implementation. So um, this is this kind of border borderlines on the vulnerability piece that it's. Uh, the, the best possible out, you know, or, you know, a very good outcome, um, even if things could have been better. So uh, realize that those things are kind of mixed up together. Um, so in, in, in kind of a recap, uh, it, it really does become kind of an indebted responsibility. Um, I could not have done anything that I've, you know, done without uh, open source, my, you know, my, my fine golden thread would have been completely different. Um, and then how, how to engage in those situations um, is, is kind of a constant reflection process and allowing yourself uh, the space to, you know, space and humor to do that, like um, find your humor and how, how it works together. Uh, and then lastly, like I said, motivations, I, that, that word still sounds so squishy to me, but it is how I prioritize, like what is the most important thing right now? And the most important thing right now might be just the person that you're sitting with, um, not your list of to do's, um, but the way and the nature and the topic and how you're helping them to make it actually useful um, is still part of that motivation. So uh, find what's important. And um that, that is what I mean by the, the looking back at, at the golden thread. And to, to be honest with yourself, um, uh, is even to acknowledge all the other things that I can t tell you that um, 
part of even why I keep saying this is what worked for me and doesn't work for other, you know, or, you know, whatever, is that there are always other things that factor into it. And, you know, like I, I, I cannot rule out the fact that there is privilege that plays into this, uh, you know, and, and there is, it's not just dumb luck. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I can't say that it, it, like there was a lot of hard work and whatever, but, uh, and I'm not saying that I've arrived either. Jesus Christ. Like, um, I'm, I'm just saying that like, when you look back at what got you to where you are, be very real with yourself. Um, uh, because if, if I want and also to acknowledge that, you know, how best to help others is to acknowledge things like, um, uh, your, your life situation privilege and otherwise, then you, you might be completely tone deaf to even engage with other people. So this, this is part of that hindsight as well and realizing that um, it's a constant education process and it's a constant improvement process. So um, yeah, with that, uh, I think most people, it, it, feel free to reach out to me, find me. Um, and with that, I think we might be able to take a few questions, but otherwise. Thank you. Uh, Vincent, you're awesome, as I pointed out before your talk. And I've been following the chat, the stage chat, and it's just so what I can say is that your story resonates for so many. That's exactly what Karsten Wade said. Actually, I took his quote. Your story resonates for so many um, people were just so um, excited to hear that, like, they could see themselves in you. And um, among us, we found out we have former chefs. We have 7-Eleven managers. Um, myself, I was a Trader Joe's cashier yeah. for a decade. Um, flash website builder, yeah. somebody admitted to doing, Jeff Ligon. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, not so many questions, just you really, um, prompted this amazing dialogue in the chat that you couldn't see, but we were all just, just like sharing with you the fact that we're, we're all in this together. And thank you for being so honest and being yourself. And um, for me, a, a quote that came into my mind while I was listening to you was that every day I'm at work, um, at work being like right here in my, in my house, but, and, and I say, like, um, you know, I know I've made some good choices in my life when I'm at doing my work at work. And I'm like thinking, I can't believe I get paid for this because I think that every day, like I'm doing my my work. And like, I can't believe I actually get paid for this. This is so awesome. And it, it, and, and it, like is, you, it, um, it took me so long to figure that out um, well into my 30s, you know, well past. Yeah, I just. It, yeah. Yeah, and and even that one, like it, it is, there's always a don't don't exactly. ever think that you you missed yeah. the opportunity. Either My whole because, life, I would, I, yep, um, I would be frustrated. And I'd be like, like, gosh, I should, you know, I wish I would have done this. But you said, in hindsight, you can look back, and when you're when you're at a place, you can look back and say, oh, like I had to go through all of that stuff before because it's what brought me here. Um, so yeah, you just yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like it, it would be. Uh, uh, an all it, it'd be a much longer talk, especially as as I would want to hear everybody else's stories. But when you start realizing, like, even the little things of like, oh yeah, I did, you know, have to, exposure to this kind of personality for a long time. I guess that fully prepared me for now exposing being, you know, dealing with these other kind of personalities now, uh, or this. You know, like, you you start looking back at those kind of conversations and realizing that, that like things have yeah. prepared you for this moment right now. So. Yeah, um, I just have to add um, stuff about it. McDonald's janitor in the house, cabinet maker, <laughs> cabinet nice. maker. Yeah, so. Yeah, and they're they're unglorious, but at some point you you realize that they they factored in that you know, like, and uh, the thing I, I love most about it is that like, so many folks were like willing to get their hands dirty because they they mm -hmm. even at, like in code, but it's because they've like. I've, I've had so much worse than this. Like <laughs> this is, this is great. And I'm excited to be here because I've had yeah, so yeah, much totally. worse than yeah, this. Like... Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. So, and um, with that, uh, actually we are, oh my gosh, we're like oh. on the dot of when we were supposed to close. So Ir Irvishi and Langdon, you can come back on nice. um, and let's close this keynote out. And uh, thank you so much.
Uh, please, everybody, find us on the chat. Enjoy. Look around. If you're confused about anything, I know exactly. Rich is like, how'd you get a star like Vincent to keynote? <laughs> oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. Thank oh, you. Well, good. Well, well cheers. And I'm, I'm excited and I look forward to uh, hanging out with Absolutely. everybody again in future yeah. in person. Thank comps, you. So. All right, guys. Let's get this conference started. Anything Enjoy, else? everybody. We hope it's great. Yep. We hope you have a great time. <laughs>